It's Friday, February 11th. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and today we're going to be discussing the preliminary report on the Srivijaya Flight 182 accident that occurred on 9 January of this year. This preliminary report is based on some primary flight data recorder information, and as of the time of this report, and I believe as of today, the CVR or cockpit voice recorder has yet to be recovered in this accident. So with this FDR data, we can deduce how this aircraft was lost, but without the CVR data, we can't figure out very easily why the crew was unable to recover from this unusual attitude recovery. So let's dive into this report and I'll be giving you background information in layman's terms so that we can all understand this information. So let's start with the factual information history of the flight. On 9 January 2021, the Boeing 737-500 aircraft registered Papa Kilo Charlie Lima Charlie was being operated by Srivijaya Air on a scheduled passenger air flight from Jakarta to Pontianak. That's about a two hour flight or so. The flight number was Srivijaya 182. According to the flight plan filed, the fuel endurance was for three hours and 50 minutes. This aircraft, by the way, is a 500 series 737. It's a 1994 model of Boeing 737 formerly owned by United Airlines with about 69,000 hours total time on the airframe, which is about typical for an aircraft of that vintage. At 0736 UTC, that's universal time, 1436 local time, that's 2.36 p.m. local time in daylight conditions, I believe the flight was delayed for some weather. This is not mentioned here in the in this portion of the factual report. Flight 182 departed from runway 25 right of Jakarta. There were two pilots, four flight attendants, and 56 passengers on board the aircraft. At 1436.46, so that's 2.36 and 46 seconds, the pilot contacted the Terminal East controller and was instructed Srivijaya 182 identified on departure via SID, the SID, unrestricted climb flight level 290, and the instruction was read back by the pilot. So the crew was cleared this Abasa 2D SID, standard instrument departure procedure, off of runway 25 right, which meant that the aircraft made a roughly 180 degree turn after takeoff to a right downwind departure and then a left turn at Wraith to a heading of about 012 degrees to proceed on course to Abasa. And they were cleared to climb initially unrestricted to 290. That means they don't have to stop and level off. At 1436.51 local time, the FDR flight data recorder recorded that the autopilot system was engaged at an altitude of 1,980 feet. I assume that's MSL, and that's pretty standard procedure. A couple thousand feet, go ahead and engage the autopilot. About two minutes later, at 1438.42, I'm going to start doing these, this time and the difference in time to show you just how quick things progressed here. At 1438.42 local time, the FDR data recorded that as the aircraft climbed past 8,150 feet, the thrust lever on the left engine started reducing, while the thrust lever position of the right engine remained. The FDR data also recorded the left engine N1 was decreasing, whereas the right engine N1 remained. Remember N1 is your primary power source on the Boeing 737. It's the first engine gauge you're going to see when looking at the ICAS panel. N1 being the low pressure first compressor section of the CFM 56 engine. At 1438.51, this is nine seconds later, 
The pilot requested to the controller for a heading change of 075, that'd be a right hand turn from about 012 degrees on the SID to 075 degrees to avoid weather conditions and the controller approved the request. Ten seconds later, the controller instructed the pilot to stop the climb at 11,000 feet to avoid conflict with another aircraft with the same destination that was departing from 25 left. The instructions were read back by the Srivijaya 182 pilot. So because he wants to deviate for weather, he's going to get in the way of some other departing traffic. So instead of the original clearance to climb unrestricted, he's now giving a altitude restriction to level off at 11,000 feet. 46 seconds later, at 1439.47, the FDR data recorded the aircraft's altitude was about 10,600 feet with a heading of 046 degrees and continuously decreasing. Kind of poorly worded, lost in translation, but he's turning continuously to the left. The compass heading is decreasing, i.e. the aircraft was turning to the left. The thrust lever of the left engine continued decreasing. The thrust lever of the right engine remained. Seven seconds later, at 1439.54, the controller instructed the pilot to climb to an altitude of 13,000 feet, and the instruction was read back by the pilot of SJ-182. This was the last known recorded transmission by the flight. So he gave him an intermediate level off, that traffic conflict was clear and he step climbed him up another 2,000 feet to remain clear of this other traffic. 11 seconds later at 1440.05, the FDR data recorded that the aircraft altitude was about 10,900 feet, which was the highest altitude recorded in the FDR before the aircraft started its descent. The autopilot system then disengaged at that point with a heading of 016 degrees. It doesn't explain if the autopilot just kicked off, more on that in a moment, or if, if somebody turned off the autopilot. I suspect that the autopilot simply kicked off on its own. The, pinch, the pitch angle was about 4.5 degrees nose up and the aircraft rolled to the left to more than 45 degrees angle of bank. The thrust lever position of the left engine continued decreasing while the right thrust lever remained. Nobody was taking over control of the throttles. Five seconds later at 1440-10 the FDR data recorded the auto throttle system disengaged. Again it doesn't tell and it probably cannot tell how the th auto throttles were disengaged. Did they, did they automatically disengage or did a crew member disengage them? The auto throttle disengaged and the pitch angle was more than 10 degrees nose down. They don't discuss what the bank angle was at this moment. About 20 seconds later the FDR stopped recording and they give the last known coordinates of the aircraft. And then they go on to the attempt to recover communications with the air crew and then the ensuing search and air rescue. Investigators will be looking at a much more complete FDR readout on this accident very soon. In that readout, they'll be able to distinguish the airspeed, which is missing in this preliminary report, a very key component. And in the FDR data should be a readout of the captain's indicated airspeed or airspeed indicator and the first officer's airspeed indicator. Make sure those two airspeed indicators are working correctly and in unison. And what was the airspeed? Did there was a if you look at the ADSB data, the, the granular ADSB data, it looks like there was a drop in ground speed on this flight once this upset occurred, but we can't tell if that was a if there was a corresponding drop in airspeed. Uh, it's hard to tell whether that dip in ground speed is, a result, is a, a result of the aircraft spiraling down towards the ground and not having much across the ground speed or ground speed. That needs, this all needs to be corroborated with airspeed. 
Also in the detailed FDR data should be exact control input movements and they'll be able to recreate exactly what the control inputs were by the crew if there were any. The autopilot on a 737 or any airliner type airplane can hang on to that airplane so to speak in a fairly severely mistrimmed situation up to a point at a point which the trim of the aircraft gets so mistrimmed the autopilot is going to suddenly and quite startlingly let go the autopilot will kick off automatically kick off when the autopilot automatically kicks off it will give you a warning light and a warning horn to let you know that the autopilot is off in this case with the left engine auto throttle coming back undetected by the crew and the right engine auto throttle staying up you're creating a huge bit of yaw on this aircraft and the autopilot will try to hang on to this aircraft as best as it, as it can and it sounds like the aircraft was already beginning to start a uncommanded turn to the left because of this adverse yaw of the split throttles the crew not taking any action about it I suspect investigators are going to find out that this may have been exacerbated a bit by the level off when you level the aircraft off the good throttle should come back a bit in anticipation of the level off and then when you request the climb that good throttle is going to come back up to initiate that climb which is going to further exacerbate the situation. In this case that autopilot's going to hang on until all of a sudden it lets go and BAM it's going to go right over to the 45 degrees of bank or so as described in this report. It's up to the crew to take control and recover from this unusual attitude. More on that later. Now let's go look at some of the findings in this report. Some of the findings in this report include they found that the pilots and flight attendants held valid licenses and medical certificates. Everybody was current and qualified for this flight and well rested. The air traffic controller held a valid license and medical certificate and the aircraft had a valid airworthiness certificate and certificate of registration. They also found that it appears at this time that the aircraft impacted the water in one piece with both engines running. Now let's go back and look at the aircraft's recent maintenance history. The aircraft maintenance log AML recorded that the aircraft had two deferred maintenance items DMIs related to the first officer's mock airspeed indicator and another one to the auto throttle system. DMI number list 07956. On 25 December of 2020, during a pre-flight check, the engineer, what we call the mechanic here in the States, found the first officer's mock airspeed indicator malfunctioned. The engineer then transferred the defect into the DMI list number 07956 due to unavailability of spare parts. According to the Srivijaya Air Boeing 737 minimum equipment list, MEL, the item was classified as a repair category C. MEL repair category C means the item must be repaired within 10 consecutive calendar days, 240 hours, excluding the day of the malfunction was recorded in the AML. You 737 drivers out there, look up your MEL and let me know, do you have an MEL that allows you to operate with the first officer's airspeed indicator in op? Or are they talking about just the mock portion of the airspeed indicator being in op and the rest of the airspeed indicator working satisfactorily. On 4 January 2021, so this went from the 25th of December to the 4th of January, this report doesn't explain if this air aircraft flew during that time period, but I assume it was, the first officer's mock airspeed indicator was replaced and test result was satisfied. As such, the DMI list number was closed. Now on to the auto throttles. DMI number list 07958. On 3 January on 3 January of 2021, the pilot reported that the auto throttle was unserviceable. It didn't work. The engineer rectified the problem by cleaning the auto throttle's computer's electrical connector. After reinstallation, the bit or built-in test equipment test result was good. A day later, on 4 January, the pilot reported that the auto throttle was unserviceable. This is what we call a repeat write-up. 
The engineer tried cleaning the autothrottle computer's electrical connector, but the problem remained and it was transferred to DMI list number 07958. On 5 January, a day later, the engineer rectified the problem as stated in the DMI number 07958 by cleaning the autothrottle toga, the takeoff go round switches and conducted a bite test on the auto throttle computer. The bite test result was good and the DMI, the DMI was closed. So that's a repeat write-up that again uh, occurred or reoccurred on this flight. This is why it's important to review the aircraft maintenance logbook before each flight, the last couple of days of logbook entries, to see if you have any recurring write-ups and anticipate problems with those systems along your flight. Now let's take a look at the pilot's background. The PIC, the pilot in command, 54-year-old Indonesian married with a lot of flying time, 17,904 hours of total flying time. He was ATP rated, air transport pilot rated. He got that rating on 11 August of 1997. He had over 9,000 hours in the Boeing 737 and hours showing recency of experience as well and held a first class medical. The co-pilot was 34-year-old Indonesian, married, had a commercial pilot's license. This is a big difference between the way these flights are conducted here in the States versus overseas. Here in the States, as a result of several high-profile accidents, it has been required for a while now that both pilots in a Part 121 airline operation have at a minimum an ATP air transport pilot rating which here in the states requires a minimum of 1,500 hours of flying time. Overseas the right seater still only requires a commercial pilot's license and in this case and, and often these pilots are what's called ab initio trained. They are trained from the ground up by the company that's going to hire them directly into the right seat of in this case the Boeing 737. So the first officer had a total of 5,107 flying hours, time and type, 737, 4,957 hours. So this pilot got hired on ab initio as a commercial pilot with only 150 hours flying time. Hmm. Aircraft upset training and unusual attitude recovery is a regular part of Srivijaya's training program. It looks like they have that training once every 24 months and both of these pilots were coming up due for this training later on this year. To their credit, as a result of this accident, Srivijaya is moving that training up to the very next time everybody gets in the simulator, they're going to review their upset training and unusual attitude training. And hopefully they'll be doing this in a scenario based training profile that will closely match what information we have so far on this accident. Finally, some words about unusual attitude recoveries. Unusual attitude recoveries are something that you just have to naturally react to. Over years and years of training in different types of aircraft, if you're a f former fighter pilot or an aerobatic pilot, or even a general aviation pilot, you are well versed in unusual attitude recoveries and you will just naturally recover the aircraft. It'll become fairly instinctive. Airline style training, they, th this procedure is listed in a QRH or quick reaction handbook or checklist, but you have absolutely no time to reference a checklist. You can train it to some standards that has a, a certain level of rote memory to it, but effectively, it's a natural and intuitive reaction to recover the aircraft from an unusual attitude. A couple things about an airliner. First off, getting an airliner in an unusual attitude is an extremely startling event. It's, and for the, for the first officer with the 5,000 hours, He's probably never done an actual unusual attitude recovery. Maybe in those first 150 hours of his flying time in a, in, in, in a real airplane. He's practiced it many times in the simulator. In the simulator, typically one of the training scenarios they'll give you for this is they'll just say, okay, close your eyes, and the sim pilot puts the aircraft into an unusual attitude on freeze, and then 
unfreezes the aircraft and says your aircraft and you recover the airplane. It's rare that they get into a scenario based training procedure, but they will be after this, uh, that, that leads you into an unusual attitude from some sequence of events, like a th split in the auto throttles. In an airliner type aircraft, if you have a nose low unusual attitude recovery situation, looking out the windows, the front windows of the airplane, you if you can even see the ground, if you're not in the clouds, you may only be able to see the ground. You may not be able to see the horizon is what I'm saying. If you have a nose high unusual attitude, again, you may not be able to see the horizon. All these unusual attitude recoveries are done based on the instruments, every time, all the time in the airliners. The airliner's HSI or horizontal situation indicator is designed such that it will always show you where the horizon is. No matter how many degrees nose high or nose low, that artificial horizon will always show you where the horizon is. It also has a pointer that's always going to point to the vertical. It's always going to show you which way is is up. <laughs> and so you need to move that pointer the shortest direction to get the wings level. So in a nose low recovery, and we'll review, I got a little uh, training video clip compliments of uh, Air Boyd, uh, an old school air training video on unusual attitude recoveries. And this, this hasn't changed in years. In a nose low banked unusual attitude, you need to first roll the wings level and then pull up to the horizon. You may even need to unload slightly to roll the aircraft quickly at, before you pull up to the horizon. You, the, if you pull and roll at the same time, you're going to get a very slow roll rate out of the aircraft versus roll first and then pull. It's called unloading the aircraft. Anytime the wings are loaded up with G, you're going to re Deuce or slow your roll weight because the wings are working too hard. In a nose high unusual attitude, you may want to let the nose slice down to the horizon before you roll the wings level. All this just needs to come intuitively and naturally to you as a pilot, and any exposure to air, some basic aerobatic training can help instill this training. But still the biggest factor to overcome is the natural human instinct of becoming startled because events like this are so rare in large transport category aircraft. So I hope this gives you a little better understanding of what we know so far as to what happened on Srivijaya's flight 182. Thanks so much for your support of this channel and especially the patrons over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.